The drugs that are being prescribed to the tune of close to a billion dollars a year here in America that families put their faith into that this might help mom or dad are actually worsening the decline in their cognitive function. And I really find that using these principles of functional medicine for the brain is one of the most amazing breakthroughs that we've ever seen in, in medicine. In fact, the head of neurology at Cleveland Clinic said, Mark, if you're right, and he was dubious that I was right, he said, if you're right, this is the greatest breakthrough in neuroscience in 50 years. So how did you end up going from a traditional board-certified neurologist to being the guy you are and breaking all the taboos about what we think and what's true in medicine and telling, telling a very different story about the brain. In a word, I'd say dissatisfaction. So here I am. So like the Rolling Stones can't get no yeah. satisfaction. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say how did it happen? A lot of drugs. No, but uh, I was very dissatisfied as a mainstream neurologist working in a practice with two other neurologists doing what neurologists do, basically diagnose and adios, you know, making rounds at the hospital, seeing 40, 50 patients a day, and then going to the clinic and writing prescriptions. Di diagnose and adios means you diagnose the patient and then there's nothing you can do for them. Yeah, and As I a felt- neurologist, you say goodbye. That's right, <laughs> and I felt impotent by that. I mean, I, I, that wasn't why I wanted to become a physician. I wanted to turn things around. Uh, I'm by nature a fixer, no matter what it is, I like to fix things. And we don't do that as neurologists. To this day, you're really treating symptoms, you're not treating the underlying problem, much less preventing the underlying problem, which is a place that I think you and I will go to during this interview. But it's really, as I've said many times, focusing on the smoke, but not the fire. Mm -hmm. What's really going on? And it turns out that the brain is no different in comparison to the heart, in comparison to immune-related issues, the liver. Mm -hmm. And that is, it is a reflection of things that aren't right, primarily as it relates to the brain and the heart, et cetera, the pancreas and diabetes, through the process of inflammation. Inflammation is as detrimental to the brain as it is to the rest of the body. Our current popular lifestyle choices are fanning the flames of inflammation, yeah. which is actually redundant because inflammation comes from the word inflame, basically, yeah. who knew? Uh, so that is become the, the focus of the work, is to go upstream, not looking at a downstream treatment for re ridding the brain of this toxic beta amyloid or helping the brain make more chemical acetylcholine, which doesn't work, but rather... Which are the drugs that have been tried for Alzheimer's and exactly, failed massively. And we're going to get into that too, I, uh, I'm certain. Uh, but realizing that, yes, Alzheimer's is by and large a preventable disease. That's mm -hmm. a disease affecting 5.4 million Americans right now, which is largely preventable. What is it like for families to go through that? I'm a neurologist. I've gone through that with many, many families, uh, dealing with da their dad, their mother, their husband, their wife. And my father died of the disease too. Yeah. I mean, um, it's how do you put a, a value on the emotional uh, content of that experience? You cannot especially when you know that it is largely preventable. So um, these are you know, the lemons from which we make the lemonade. We're going to move forward. We're going to light the candle. We do have to curse the darkness a little bit, and I'm certain that's, that will come up today. Yeah. Uh, but we've got to do our very best to let people know there's another side of the story that they have not heard. Yeah. And the one side of the story <clears throat> that, there, that is being um, continually uh, looked at is live your life however you choose, and then when you are suddenly suffering from a problem, cognitively impaired, we've got a pill for you. I mean, that's been a narrative save you, right? that is, was on the Alzheimer's uh, Awareness, the Alzheimer's Association website that I looked at yesterday that said, these are the drugs for Alzheimer's that will slow the disease. And what does that mean? So you don't get in the nursing home uh, three months faster, right? So it delays the... Admission well, that's what it says. Therefore, therefore exciting, you should right? take these drugs. Right. Well, it turns out that in the Journal of the American Medical Association online in November of 2018 mm -hmm. was a meta-analysis study uh, published by a Dr. Richard Kennedy. And that's a study of all the studies that have been done. It is. And what he found was that not only are the currently two, the two largest classes of drugs that are prescribed for Alzheimer's, uh, memantine and then what are called cholinesterase inhibitors, not only except in Namenda, which are the drugs people exactly are right, uh, Donepazil being the generic form, <clears throat> but not only do they not work, but they actually speed people's cognitive decline. And and I'm going to take a, a pause with that 
Think about it. The drugs that are being prescribed to the tune of close to a billion dollars a year here in America that families put their faith into that this might help mom or dad are actually worsening the decline in their cognitive function. It's like marketing a drug for blood pressure that's going to raise the blood pressure. Yeah. So when we... The thing is, doctors feel like they have to do something and there's nothing to do here. And I say, great, here's what we should do. We should prevent that disease in the first place. And we know that we can do it. Despite... You know, the ideas that what we're talking about are, are termed pseudoscience, for so let's, example. Let's back up a little bit. You, you talked about inflammation being a huge issue in Alzheimer's, but it's also an issue in depression, in ADHD, in autism, autism in Parkinson's disease, in, in cancer, can- in diabetes, in coronary artery disease. Of all, it's pretty much every chronic illness, exactly. but particularly the brain. And I don't think people realize that. And so the question is, what is driving all this inflammation, right? In a word, uh, our diets. And we can start there and then work through the whole mechanistic pathway that ultimately leads to people losing their cognitive function. So Mm -hmm. our diets being higher in simple carbohydrates with reduction in healthy fat, reduction in dietary fiber, paves the way through multiple mechanisms for our blood sugars to rise, our insulin uh, activity to reduce, and ultimately that leads to inflammation. And they call Alzheimer's now type 3 diabetes. That's it's right. Like diabetes of the brain. E- exactly right. So it puts the ball back in the court of you, the consumer, not you, Mark Hyman, the doctor, but you, the consumer, to do something and do it right now. And that is simply change your diet. Other things are really important. Restorative sleep, aerobic exercise, meditation. We could talk about a lot of things. Yeah, it's anti-inflammatory to meditate. You bet. Know. Uh, But if we can simply focus on the fact that the global diet is becoming westernized, that is increasing inflammation globally, and we're seeing incredible increased rates of things like Alzheimer's globally, those are important dots to connect and important dots to leverage because we can turn this thing around. Yeah, It's it's both the diet and how the diet affects our microbiome. Exactly right. Which is influencing our brain all the time through creating inflammatory molecules that get to the brain. And how does how does your poop get to your brain? That doesn't even make sense. Could you break that down for us? Sure, break down the poop. <laughs> uh, and as you've written about, uh, and you know, as, and you coined the term uh, diabetes, the relationship between diabetes, higher blood sugar, obesity, creation of inflammatory chemicals, damaging the brain, heart, etc. We now know that. Um, what what sets the what we call the set point of inflammation in the body is a one cell layer thick that, as you've said in the past, separates the garbage dump. Those are your words uh, from right. <laughs> sewer. From, I think uh, I call it a sewer, uh, the sewer, sewer. Uh, from the rest of the body. Chemicals in the gut remain, by and large, dangerous, damaging chemicals. We call them antigens. Need to stay there mm. when they transgress the gut lining. Get through the gut lining. They stimulate immune cells to create the very mediators of inflammation, chemicals that we call uh, cytokines, that then initiate these damaging activities for cells throughout the body. The downstream effect of inflammation is a turning on of the production of chemicals called free radicals, Mm. damaging Mm. chemicals that damage our protein, our fat, and even our DNA, and even our energy producers called mitochondria. Mm. So it all starts with diet. Diet nurtures our 100 trillion microbial friends that live in the gut and want me to be healthy. They want you to be healthy, but we have to feed them right. Yeah, think about like a rainforest. It's it's got so many inputs of light and water and nutrients, whereas a monocrop cornfield. What you're getting at is, in a word, is diversity. Yeah. And just as we depend upon the the diversity of uh, in the Amazon forest, which is being... uh, destroyed it's an ecosystem in your you, gut. you're right it's an ecosystem in the gut and it's this relationship between our gut friends in our gut and also on our skin in the brain who knew in the placenta who knew uh this relationship that we have to reconnect to so in a very real sense that's one aspect of what uh, our son austin perlmutter and i are talking about moving forward and that is disconnection syndrome yeah all of the manifestations of disconnection whether it's disconnecting from our the messages of our gut microbiome, disconnecting from our DNA that is doing everything it can to keep us healthy, uh, but uh, that we are sending to it the wrong signals by virtue of 
the process of epigenetics. In other words, mm -hmm. our food choices influence the expression of our DNA. Who knew? Uh, the disconnection that we have from the good parts of our brain, we'll talk about that later, the parts of our brain that want us to be empathetic and compassionate and planning for the future. The disconnection that we have from each other as people because we're spending too much time down here looking at a screen yeah. as opposed to sharing and the life of another individual. Mm -hmm. The disconnection that we have from our communities, from other countries, and the disconnection that we have from the Ourselves. health and vitality of the planet. <laughs> and that's where we take this, that the survival of our planet is really predicated on reconnecting at all of these levels. But in a sense, what you're talking about, David, is the role that your brain plays in allowing you to be connected or causing you to be disconnected. And that the way we care for our brains has a profound impact on our behavior, attitude, connection. That's a very radical idea that what you eat controls your ability to be present, to be focused, to be connected. To and actually. here's what completes the circle. Yeah. What you eat, <clears throat> leveraged by, or looked at through the lens of your microbes, does affect your behavior and your choices. And at the same time, those choices that you make affect the health and vitality of your gut microbes. So what you set up is what we call a vicious cycle, whereby uh, eating the wrong foods changes the microbiome, it changes your brain, it makes you less able moving forward to make the right choices. So you make further bad choices, further damaging your gut bacteria, further changing your brain. And let me say that it's not just moment to moment changes in your brain that happens. Uh, you know, that you make the wrong decisions. But ultimately, as you continue to make these wrong decisions, you rewire your brain through a process called neuroplasticity. So you compromise your ability to tap into that part of your brain that lets you make good and appropriate decisions. And you connect uh, more aggressively to the part of your brain that is much more impulsive and much more fear-based and much more narcissistic. So basically, we move from a place of love and connection to a place of fear and reactivity. That's right. And you mentioned Alberto Violdo. We wrote a book about this years ago called The Neuroscience of Enlightenment. Power up your brain. Power up your brain. And uh, it, it dealt with what can we do first uh, in terms of our lifestyle choices to enhance this process of neuroplasticity, to enhance the brain's ability to make stronger connections. Okay, once we've got that put to bed, in other words, higher levels of omega-3s, less mm -hmm. inflammation, yeah. uh, aerobic exercise being very important, then let's do the right things, let's make the best choices, and that will then set the stage for hardwiring the brain to those good parts. It's of the pretty brain. amazing how, you know, you, you've been the pioneer in saying this, but the brain is, is plastic it can actually change and reverse some of the insults that happen so not only is it about prevention but it's about treatment or slowing down of these conditions like parkinson's and alzheimer's and i i had mercury poisoning years ago and early on i had a brain scan called a spec scan which looks at the blood flow in the brain and i had all these areas of my brain that had no blood flow that were dysfunctional they look like holes not a good thing they look like holes like swiss cheese in my brain and as i used functional medicine as i repaired my brain as i repaired my body to fix my brain essentially my gut and my also the mercury affected my gut in, in terrible ways i actually repeated the scan you know more than a decade later and all those holes had filled in my brain had recovered. Now, not, it's not something that you learn as a typical neurologist. If you love that last video, you're going to love the next one. Check it out here.